On the UConn Sports Nation hotline is Mike Carmen, who covers Purdue football for the Journal and Courier out in Indiana. Mike, thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. So Purdue is coming in this week fresh off a 30-21 to win over Oregon State in their season opener. What um, can you share about what you saw in, in the opener uh, for the Boilermakers? Well, uh, to do that, you kind of have to back up a little bit and go to the end of last season when, uh, you know, obviously it was a COVID year. Purdue only played six games. Uh, defensively, Jeff Brown felt there needed to be changes, and someone UConn is very familiar with, Bob Bianco, was Purdue's defensive coordinator last year. Well, two days after the season ended, he was fired. <laughs> so... Uh, and that led to wholesale changes on the defensive front or on the defensive side where they brought in more experienced uh, defensive coaches, a couple of former head coaches. So anyway, the big emphasis in the off season was getting the defense right, getting it, trying to straight, straightened out, play more aggressively, get guys in the right positions and build around your playmakers. Well, now fast forward to, to Saturday. Um, it, it wasn't perfect, but the defense looked better than it did last year. It was more aggressive, even though the numbers and the stats may not tell you all that. But Purdue did, you know, win the line of scrimmage battle on the on the defensive line standpoint. Uh, they were more aggressive uh, uh, on that side of the ball. Uh, they were able to, to make some plays, some fourth down stops and stuff like that. So the number one takeaway was the defense did look better. Offensively, uh, they still struggled to run the ball, which is a big emphasis this year. Uh, the passing game was okay. Uh, Plummer threw for over 300 yards. Uh, and they were able to utilize the tight end in the fourth quarter to, to put the game away. So uh, a good performance, a good start. Now they just have to try to figure out a way to, to build on that and get some momentum going into the Big Ten season. And you mentioned quarterback Jack Plummer. Uh, just looking at his stats, he seems to be a very accurate passer. Um, not sure, really sure his whole story. He only played three games last year. Did he come in halfway through? Um, and, and what is your take on him as a quarterback? Well, again, you got to go back a couple years for Jack Plummer. He's a, he's a junior right now. He's, this is his fourth year in the program. Uh, a couple years ago, uh, their starting quarterback, Elijah Sindelar, got hurt. Jack came in, played seven or eight games, then he got hurt uh, and ended his season. Last year, he was in a quarterback competition with Aiden O'Connell, who's still around. O'Connell won that, but then O'Connell got hurt in the third game. Then Jack came in and played the last three. So they went through the same quarterback competition this year, basically with the same guys, and Plummer won it. So that's why Plummer was the starter uh, on Saturday, and he'll, he'll, he'll maintain that as long as – Purdue continues to win, and he continues to play well. He's got a good arm. Uh, he, the reason probably why he won the, the competition this time, he's just more mobile. Uh, this allows him to move the pocket. It allows them to generate some rushing yards from their quarterback position, which is something they need to do. Uh, so that, that's kind of why he, he, he won the job this year. And he was able to, to provide some of that on Saturday, and he'll be asked to, to do a lot more of that as the season goes on. And 71% completion percentage last year, and I think the same in the opener. Um, speaks to the receiver core that he has, the tight ends. I know they like to utilize them. Lost Rondell Moore, obviously, to the NFL draft over the offseason. What can you say about David Bell at wide receiver? Big numbers, eye-popping, I think 16 touchdowns over the last two years. Uh, what does he bring to the table? Uh, he's an NFL talent. I mean, that's there's no question about it. Uh, this last Saturday was his 11th hundred yard receiving game, uh, and I, you know, he'll break the, he'll break the school record this year. I believe the school record's 13 uh, hundred yard games by a receiver, so he'll break that record this year, assuming he stays healthy. But he's not. He, he's a guy that doesn't he doesn't look like he's running hard. And, playing fast, but he is. He just does it with ease. He's very smooth. He's been compared to Jerry Rice and how he runs his routes, mm -hmm. uh, just how uh, effort, effortlessly that he does it. But you throw the ball up, he's going to make a play. Uh, and and that's what, you know, that's what Purdue has done in the past with him is when they need a big play, they'll go to him. And if you get it in the vicinity, usually he's going to make, he's going to make the play. Uh, but he's, you know, he's by far their top receiver. 
they do need to get up some other guys involved just to create some balance and maybe take some of the attention away from David Bell. But even in double coverage or just press man situations, he, he's still been able to thrive. Yeah, he seems to be a tough matchup for a UConn secondary that's really going through some growing pains right now, changing coaching staff, etc. Um, helping Bell out, I know there's a couple of tight ends that uh, maybe Plummer goes to. It seems like they have a big part of this offense. Is that accurate? We, they, they do, but I, I feel like they need to be a bigger part of the offense. Now, they were in the fourth quarter, or at least Payne Durham, the, the main tight end, was in the fourth quarter uh, last uh, week. Uh, I think he made five of his seven catches in the fourth quarter. Had a couple touchdowns. Uh, made some. Made a couple key down, key third down catches too. Um, but when Jeff Brom came here five years ago, he said the tight end would be a huge part of what they do offensively. And they, you know they had Rondell Moore, so you have, you have to feed the ball to him. You have David Bell, you have to feed the ball to him. So it's only one football to go around. But I, I do think the tight end can be a, a valuable weapon for them. As, you, as teams pay so much attention to David Bell and some other guys uh, in that offense, that a, a guy like Payne Durham can have big games like he had, you know, last week. Now, I'm, I'm sure they'll, they'll pay UConn will pay a little bit more attention to him this week based on what he did last week. But um, sometimes I, I think I just think defenses go to sleep on tight ends, and the more you can get them involved, I think that just opens up the offense a whole lot more. And I would I would expect Purdue to continue to do that, you know, this year. Now switching over to defense, you mentioned coaching changes. Uh, I, I, like you said, Diaco came in, and, and was he serving as D coordinator? Or was uh, Anthony Poindexter running it last year? Well, they had the co titles, but they did. Diaco was the play caller okay. and the, the organizer of the defense. Gotcha. Yeah, they kind of reunited there because I know Poindexter was his DC here at UConn. So. Um, Purdue has one of the best talents defensively, I think, projected close to top 10 in this upcoming NFL draft in George Kalaftis. Um, what, is he, what do you see from him at uh, the defensive line spot? Well, he's just a, he's a monster. He, had, he didn't have a sack last week, but he had eight uh, hurries or pressures, however you want to define it, which led the nation. Uh, so he, he was just that close to getting probably four sacks last week. He made a key third down stop. He, he just has a relentless motor. He's a big kid, hasn't played football really that long. But he's just a, he's a, he's a big, strong kid. He can fight through double teams. Uh, he's very quick. Um, he, he's, his technique is, is way advanced based on his football age. You know, if you if you really drill down and watch some of last week's game, when he would hit the quarterback, he didn't land on the quarterback, and that can get you a penalty for roughing the quarterback. So he hits him, and his technique is so refined that he just he lets the quarterback land on the ground while George stops himself from from hitting him any further. Uh, and the new defensive line coach Mark Hagan has really worked with George on his technique and worked on the fundamentals that I believe it's really taking him to another level. And, you know, and I, I, I do think that UConn's going to have uh, a lot of trouble keeping him out of the backfield on Saturday. They're going to have to, to to devote some more resources to, to doing that. And there's only so many resources you can, <laughs> you can devote to that. But I, 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 I would say UConn's going to have some issues dealing with George Karloftis on Saturday. Yeah, certainly. I was actually having some conversations earlier today on that. It, they're going to have to have a tight end, especially helping out. If he's on the right side of the line, we have a new right tackle um, that's just breaking in. He just played his second game at the college level. Um, he's going to need some help because the line has certainly struggled to start the year. So, um, well, they'll move, him, they'll move George around, too. They'll move him to the left, to the right. I, I, I firmly believe they have a scheme where he, he is a down lineman, too, probably in the middle. But I don't think they'll they'll use that this week. But yeah. they'll move him around a lot, and he's used to it. And he, he there's there's really one goal for him: get across the line of scrimmage and make a play. You know, I, I'm interested to see how many scouts turn out because UConn does have. Uh, I know their their record over the last several years hasn't been good, but their left tackle is projected late first, early second, probably. Uh, so that could be a potential good matchup just to see how he fares against a, a quality. Uh, opponent, uh, just in that one-on-one matchup on the line. Um, 
I know George is a local kid. Uh, he had opportunities to go to, I think, Alabama. I saw he had an offer. What ultimately made him stay home? Uh, the, uh, I think the local connection there. He, he didn't grow up here. He just he moved here. His mom is a is a West Lafayette graduate, so they moved back here after some family things. And uh, uh, you know, Purdue did a really good job recruiting him uh, early on, and you know, made him a priority, and you know, did everything they needed to do to make sure that he was in the in the fold here, but. Excuse me. Michigan was was heavily involved. Ohio State was. There were a lot of big time schools that wanted him, but you know, in the end, it's it was right across the street. He had an opportunity to step in and play immediately, which he did. And 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 I think this year the the addition of Mark Hagan as their defensive line coach has really cemented that whole thing uh, with with him. And uh, it was just it was it was the right fit, right time, and uh, it, it's all it's all paid off. Now, UConn's going to be showcasing a new quarterback on Saturday while avoiding the rush that George is going to bring as well as the rest of the D-line. What's he going to be seeing from the secondary? Um, is it a young group? Is it an experienced group? Um, how, is, how is the UConn receiver core going to fare? They're, they're an experienced group. Uh, Corey Trice, who made a key play last week uh, against Oregon State, he had moved to cornerback two years ago, right before the 2019 season. He's long. He's six three. He's very athletic. Um, I, I think that's going to be a tough matchup for for UConn to try to get some separation on him. The other cornerback is Dedrick Mackey. He's he's not as tall as Corey, but has plenty of experience. He's he's extremely strong. Um, so I, I think one issue facing UConn's offense is just being able to to get free of Purdue's secondary and, and their cornerbacks. And, and with that, you have to be really accurate with your passes because Purdue played really tight and coverage last week. I don't anticipate that, that changing uh, a whole lot uh, this week. Uh, so I, I think that's probably going to be the big issue. And, um, you know, can the quarterback get out of the pocket and extend some plays and let his receivers kind of come back to him? They're going to have to be creative in, in a lot of things that they do. And they're going to have to, you know, just kind of stay with plays maybe a little bit longer if they can to, to try to create, uh, you know, try to create some big yardage, you know, down the field. I didn't listen into to Coach Brahms' uh, press conference this week, but I know he has experience coming to UConn. Did he talk about that? And just overall, what's the sense of Brahm in the Purdue program, uh, what he's brought to the program as a whole? Well, he did talk about playing uh, UConn back uh, – when Louisville, he was an assistant coach at Louisville. Uh, I believe both uh, both schools were in the same conference. So, and he had a history with you know Randy Etzel when when he was the head coach the first time. So, you know, when we talked to him on Monday, the second part of the Randy Etzel story hadn't hadn't developed yet. So, uh, he he now knows he's getting an interim coach on on Saturday as opposed to, to Randy Etzel. But yeah, he has a history and he, you know, he had a lot of, res- has a lot of respect for, for Randy and what he, what he did at UConn and, and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, this is year five for, for Jeff Brom. Uh, first two years were, were good. Went to bowl games for Purdue. Uh, but the last two years they've had back to back losing seasons. They've had some key injuries uh, during that time. You know, there was one play against Minnesota in 2019 that took out Rondell Moore and their quarterback, and they were both lost for the season. So that was a one-two uh, whammy right there for Purdue, and that, that's been the issue. They haven't been able to stay healthy, and then you know last year's kind of one of the hard years to evaluate uh, games, but could never finish the deal. And you had the whole Bob Yako and and some of the issues that he caused on the defensive side. So um, you know I. This is a year for Purdue just to try to get back to a bowl game, get six wins with the schedule that they're going to play, and then kind of reset things from there. Because they're, you know, they're likely going to lose George Karloftis and David Bell because this is going to, this is their third year. They're probably going to lose them to the NFL. So you need to take advantage of having those two guys in your program and try to get to to a bowl game. And then you know you hope recruiting picks up, player development picks up. And uh, you can you can push the program forward to a point where you know Purdue becomes a regular contender for the Big Ten West. They're they're not going to win it every year, but 
they, they need to be in contention uh, for that position. And when, when Brown was hired, there was a feeling that by year five, year four, year five, that they would be in that position a little bit more on a regular basis. They, just, they, they need to get to that point. And this is an important year to kind of push toward that mark. And it is the first road game of the year for Purdue. How's the traveling fan base typically for the Boilermakers? I know COVID's still an issue, but should we expect to see some fans come up? I know there's, there's quite a bit of alumni, I think, up in this area as well. I think, yeah, that's what I've heard. I heard Purdue was supposed to play at Boston College last year, but obviously that got canceled. And I heard there was a big group from Connecticut that was on their way to to Boston College. They wanted to go to that game, and they were going to take a couple busloads of people. There is a, a strong Purdue alumni base out east, and I, I think most of the fans that will be there from Purdue will be from that area. Uh, there might be some that travel from the Midwest, but I would say a majority of them will come from you know a couple hours away there to – because this is a rare opportunity for for Purdue to be playing out there. You know, I know they were supposed to play Boston College last year, but they don't head east that often. Uh, so this is unique opportunity for the alumni that are out there. So I, I would expect a, a good showing of Purdue fans. Uh, now, the fact that UConn's struggling uh, on paper, it doesn't appear to be a close game, but if you only get one opportunity to see your your old school play in person, you're probably going to take advantage of it. That's true. Are you heading out uh, as well? Are we going to see you there on yeah, Saturday? Yeah, uh, I'll fly out uh, Friday and then uh, cover the game and then come back Sunday. So, yeah, we're, we're planning planning to go there. Looking forward to it. Been out to stores a couple times over the last few uh, decade or so covering uh, Purdue women's basketball when they played Connecticut yeah. either in the – in the NCAA tournament, or they had a regular season matchup, oh, probably 15, 16 years ago uh, in stores. So uh, I've, I've been to the area, uh, very nice, really enjoyed it. It was in the obviously in the winter time, <laughs> not, <laughs> not, not now. So yeah, just looking forward to, to getting out there and seeing seeing a game in a in a new stadium and a new location. Yeah, we should have some good weather this weekend. So safe travels, um, and I'll look to say hello uh, up in the press box uh, when we get to the stadium on Saturday. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate you reaching out and having me on your show.